Today we're talking about The Culture of Critique, a highly controversial book by Dr. Kevin McDonald, a retired professor of psychology. It's controversial because he focuses on the negative influence of some Jews in the changing of Western culture, and he argues that they did these things because they knew it would benefit Jews, and it was often at the expense of whites. Tonight I'm going to talk about Jews. <laughs> McDonald has been called an anti-Semite many times because of his work, and the Anti-Defamation League has added him to a list of extremists. But a book should be judged on its merits, and that's what we're here to do today. More specifically, in this video we're talking about Franz Boas, the man now known as the father of American anthropology. Before he changed the landscape of American anthropology, anthropology was largely race-focused. It saw different groups and cultures as largely a product of their race. Once Franz Boas was done, that was all replaced entirely by a culture-focused perspective. And that's what you've seen today, where it's generally understood that anyone can be part of pretty much any culture. There's no biological component to culture or civilization left. So let's learn a little bit more about Franz Boas, the father of American anthropology. First, he was deeply alienated from and hostile to Gentile culture, particularly the cultural ideal of Prussian aristocracy. He engaged in a, quote, lifelong assault on the idea that race was a primary source of the differences to be found in the mental or social capabilities of human groups. He focused on culture at the exclusion of race. Boaz almost single-handedly developed in America the concept of culture, which, like a powerful solvent, would in time expunge race from the literature of social science. So this one man had so much influence, but it wasn't because of data at all. Quote, Boaz did not arrive at the position from a disinterested scientific inquiry into a vexed if controversial question. There is no doubt that he had a deep interest in collecting evidence and designing arguments that would rebut or refute an ideological outlook. Racism, which he considered restrictive upon individuals and undesirable for society. There is a persistent interest in pressing his social values upon the profession and the public. So in other words, it's not like Boaz uncovered a bunch of information, and that information led everyone to collectively put aside their previous perspective and come around to a more accepting perspective. In reality, he was on an ideological crusade. But that still doesn't explain how he had so much influence. He's just one guy. How could he change all of American anthropology, especially when he was doing it from an ideological perspective, not from an evidence or fact-based perspective? Well, first, Boaz had tenure for over 40 years at Columbia, and his long time there led to his students making up the greater part of the professional core of anthropologists, who in their turn taught other students who continued the tradition. Franz Boas taught at Columbia University for half a century. The list of his students who went on to set up and teach the subject along his lines at other universities reads like the who's who of American anthropology. By the time of his death, he was rightly regarded by scholars from all over the world as the founding father of American anthropology. Boaz's most influential students were Ruth Benedict, Alexander Goldenweiser, Melville Herkowitz, Alfred Krober, Robert Lowey, Margaret Mead, Paul Radin, Edward Saper, and Leslie Speer. All but Krober, Benedict, and Mead were Jewish. But it's not like he was recruiting all Jews, right? There were three in that list of nine who were Gentiles. But Boaz specifically recruited Gentiles to keep his science from appearing partisan and compromised. So when I heard that, I was a little bit skeptical. Some of the claims here are astonishing, and some aren't. This one was more on the astonishing side, so I looked into it. As you can see, I'm putting the sources for the book and also the sources he cites in his book on the bottom of the screen. For this one, I'm going to go through it right here right now to show you the sorts of citations he makes. So first off, he's citing Efron, and Efron isn't some random guy. He's a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. His book was published by Yale University Press. This isn't some crackpot. But what's more, I was able to actually find the book on Google Books so we can take a look at the page that's being cited right here. Himself a German Jew, Boaz sought to organize a research program designed to refute scientific racism. So in other words, he decided to create a research program with the ends already in mind. Great scientist right there. <laughs> Obviously impartial. Given the state of race relations in general and the extent of anti-Semitism in American society in particular, Boaz was concerned that his Jewishness would make his science appear partisan and thus compromised. In 1933, to challenge scientific racism, he enlisted the assistance of non-Jewish scientists such as Robert McIver, Leslie Dunn, and A.T. Poffenberger. In addition to this project, 
The Boazian School of Anthropologists, which included Alfred Krober, Robert Lowey, Melville Herkowitz, Ruth Benedict, Margaret Mead, and the psychologist Otto Kleinenberg, played a central role in challenging scientific racism. So, in other words, with a slightly different perspective, but the facts are right there. The citation is correct. This guy clearly was concerned that his Jewishness would be obvious, and so he hired people explicitly because they weren't Jewish. So one of the names there, Margaret Mead, was actually very, very influential, potentially more influential than Boaz himself. She wrote a book called Coming of Age in Samoa that he actively promoted and helped her with. Coming of Age in Samoa was basically about how these primitive tribes had it all figured out. They were free of all of the bad things that Europeans had. The book was widely popular and was key to the substitution of race for culture in Americans' minds. It came out later that Mead systematically ignored cases of rape, violence, revolution, and competition in Samoa. When Mead did see negative attributes, such as rape and concern for virginity, they were attributed to Western influence rather than anything innate in them. And you can see that sort of perspective in a lot of leftists today, where they assume that basically every bad thing in the world is the result of European influence. And a lot of it comes back to this flawed study. But none of that mattered in 1915. Because by 1915, the Boazians controlled the American Anthropological Association and held a two-thirds majority on its executive board. In 1919, Boaz could state that, quote, most of the anthropological work done at the present time in the United States was done by his students at Columbia. So Boaz had a lot of influence. He was a patriarchal father figure, strongly supporting those who agreed with him and excluding those who did not. He didn't tolerate theoretical or ideological differences with his students. Individuals who disagreed were simply excluded. This really doesn't seem like science, does it? It seems like they have an ideological perspective that they're trying to actively push through science, through social science. Boaz was instrumental in completely suppressing evolutionary theory in anthropology. After the rise of the Boazians, violence primitive groups went unstudied and unmentioned. And when a rogue anthropologist did study it, his work was completely ignored and he was shunned by the rest of the anthropological community. As a result, society at large began to see violence as a uniquely European invention, and saw Europeans as the cause of all the violence in the primitive tribes. Research on racial differences ceased, and the profession completely excluded eugenicists and racial theorists. The takeover was complete. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This is basically one half of one of six chapters in the book. I'm planning on making other videos covering the other parts of culture of critique. If you like this kind of video, please let me know. And of course, hey, you you enjoyed the video? Uh, uh, maybe you should uh, subscribe. It's a button right here.